or to go to the same place at the same time is virtually impossible. The same thing has been you know, said of trying to get highly intelligent technical people to do the same thing at the same time in a coordinated fashion. So having managed and led high profile software development projects, I can definitely vouch for this uh, gentleman. So what's the, what's, the, what's the solution? I think before we attempt to answer that question, I think one of the things uh, that we first have to come grip with uh, is to ask yourself, what does it really mean to lead versus manage a team? I think we sometimes confuse the two as being the same or expect someone who is managing the project to be the leader of it, when in fact to manage something can be quite different than what it is to lead something. Conversely, someone who is truly leading a team may not be doing any management of the team in the traditional sense. I think understanding this key difference is what will allow us to understand you know, the, the, the transformations that will need to take place in order to be a truly agile servant leader. So what does it mean to, uh, to be a manager or to manage a project? So maybe my bias is kind of on display here with these uh, uh, celebrity caricatures I've chosen for my illustration. But I think, but as I say, stereotypes often exist because they are large and true. And I think while well, it's probably not fair, because um, I've worked with a few managers who exhibited great leadership skills, unfortunately, in my opinion, this has been more the exception rather than the rule. So that aside, let's look at some of the main characteristics that typically classify what it means to have a to be a manager. I think first of all, typically a person becomes a manager is usually by by virtue of his or her position. A manager usually has got formal rights in an organization. This is simply because of their status. Uh, the manager tells the subordinate what to do, and the subordinate does this not because they are you know a blind robot, but because they've been promised a reward use that minimum of salary for doing so. Conversely, in our current economic climate, I think just keeping one's job may be the sole reward, unfortunately. So managers really, you know, to get down to it, managers get paid to get things done. The same with their subordinates, often within tight within the tight constraints of time and money. So in my view, this is a classical notion of, of a manager and it fits nicely with with the you know in the in the same way with the classical notion of a project manager. Uh, but unfortunately, project managers have no direct reports, and they're expected to achieve results without any authority. In many respects, I see our project manager is a much more difficult role than a, than a traditional functional manager type role. But leaders, on the other hand, when you think about it, they, they don't have uh, subordinates, at least not when they're leading. Uh, many organizational leaders do have subordinates, but only because they're managers, in fact. But when they want to lead, truly lead, they have to give up formal author, uh, you know, authoritarian control because to lead is to have followers, and following is not a voluntary activity, right? Or I should say involuntary activity. So what are the characteristics of leaders and, and, and of, being, of having leadership? I think, first of all, telling people what to do does not inspire them to follow you. You have to actually appeal to them, showing them how following them will lead to their heart's desire. They must want to follow you enough to stop what they are doing and perhaps walk into dangerous and even situations that they would normally not consider risking. You know, consider the dangers of following a great leader like Gandhi or Martin Luther King or Dalai Lama when protesting for their causes. I think also leaders, especially ones with a strong charisma, find it easier to attract people uh, to their cause. Think about Steve Jobs from Apple, who was well known for having this in a So as part of their persuasion, they typically promise what are known as transformational benefits, such that their followers will not just re receive the extrinsic rewards, but somehow in the end they'll become better people. So although, although leaders are good with people, this actually doesn't really mean that they're friendly with them. In order to keep the mystique of leadership, they often have to uh, you know, retain a degree of separation and aloofness. Yeah, but this does not mean that leaders do not pay attention to tasks. In fact, they're often very achievement focused. But I think what they do realize, however, is that the importance of creating enthusiasm you know, in, uh, for others to work towards their vision. In my view, all leaders, and, and, and which you can see from these pictures that I have, all of them kind of very much exhibited these capabilities and characteristics that I just outlined. 
So some big questions that uh, you know left to ponder. But based on my definition and observations of the difference between managers and leaders, as well as management and leadership, which suits projects better and why? So given the title of my presentation, Agile Observant Leadership, making the leap from project manager to project leader, it's plainly obvious that I favor the true leadership style as the one to follow for project in initiatives. But isn't there always a management component to leadership or a leadership component to management? You know, when you think about the, my, based on my clearly delineated definitions of management versus leader, isn't it safe to say there's a contradiction uh, to say that a manager can be a leader or vice versa? In a sense, this is very par paradoxical. Is it realistic that you can go from a project manager to a project leader like Gandhi? What are the steps to transform oneself from a traditional project manager to an agile servant leader? Let's go on and find out. So this leads me to the notion of, a, of an agile an imperative, which is really a leadership imperative, in my opinion, to follow in order to uh, successfully lead a project. So let, let's think about that for a moment. So agile is all about collaborative problem solving which means to inspire your teams to solve prob pressing problems in a collaborative and inspiring way. It's more about coaching rather than commanding, because coaching is more in line with being a, a servant leader than one who simply commands. And then the idea of self-directing and self-organizing teams. Really, this can only be facilitated by a leader who provides the environment, conditions, and the coaching you know, to herd those cats to organize and direct themselves. Now, I'm not really talking about Scrum, Kanban, XP, as those are really just tools of the trade. I'm talking about Agile in a very broad sense that, that's needed in these rapidly changing times. And in, this kind of, in this, and in this kind of business environment, we all need to be Agile, and we all also need to be servant leaders. So let me talk a bit about, excuse me for using this overused buzzword paradigm shift, but in my view, in this particular case, it, it really does require uh, one to really shift your thinking about leading projects in a, in a traditional sense. Because to be a true agile servant leader means you emphasize, encourage, develop, and create the conditions under which uh, the role of leadership is defined. Everyone in your team uh, develops into leaders as well as followers, and this includes you as well. You know, due to the highly uncertain, dynamic, and often chaotic environments that our projects are now developed under, this, this requires a constant shift in team role and adaptability based upon the situation and context. Agile servant leadership is, is about embracing and optimizing uh, uh, of this transformational paradox. It's about both managing and leading through this paradox. So this paradox that I just outlined is, is really best explained in this Chinese notion of yin and yang, which literally means dark and light. You know, that's used to describe how polar opposites or seemingly contradictory forces are interconnected and interdependent in the natural world. And they gave rise to each other in turn. Yin and yang are really not oppositional forces, uh, but complementary forces. It's about the seen and the unseen that interact with the greater whole as part of the dynamic system. So if you see on the left side of my slide are characteristics of the project leader who both leads and serves, mentors as well as, as well as being a mentee, as well as directing their team while also following the team's directive. Likewise, on the right are characteristics of teams that self-organize yet also have to be guided. You have specialists or subject matter experts that also have to be cross-functional. Um, that, com that complete their deliverables in highly tightly planned and controlled um, you know, uh, iterations that also provide major flexibility to adapt and change. So let me start to outline the key points needed uh, for the successful transformation uh, to the uh, servant leadership role. Uh, this will include discussions on the core methods and practices that you will have to adopt and implement as well as the overall environmental factors and cultural changes that will take place between yourself, your team, your customers, and the organization as a whole. So let's, let's first look into the methods and practices that, that will facilitate you know, your transformation into, 
person to become an agile servant leader. So you know, there's this, this famous saying in software development, uh, which is to shift early and, and shift often. Um, the same could be said for any industry in any sector these days due to the grueling competitive landscape of today's business environment. So working in rapid iterations allow businesses to get working prototypes of whatever product, service, or R&D concept as quickly as possible into the real world. This is why uh, you know, the whole Agile movement typically puts iterations in two to six weeks, uh, depending on the project. Uh, but contrary to some popular misconceptions, um, these, these things are actually carefully planned for and need to be sustainable. You know, the Agile servant leaders uh, do not allow themselves or their teams to simply try and wing it, but can ensure efficient and really effective delivery of, of, of the deliverable. But using servant leadership skills means to know when to manage and drive a team to completion, while also knowing when to step back and allow them to self-organize. It's about that balancing of those paradoxes. You know, this terminology of the test-driven iterations is a slight modification of of the term used in, in the XP world of Agile, where unit tests are written first and then coded again. But I think the, the notion is universal enough that your, your iterations should always be test-driven or have a testing component that's continuously utilized. So as you develop your product, service, or concept, you should be continually testing in concert so that you're, in effect, running controlled experiments to determine what works best for your customer. This is what will allow you to you know, empirically inspect and adapt continually so that you are engaged in continuous improvement. This practice also facilitates the learning and experimentation throughout your organization. You can leverage the practice of trying out ideas in small controlled fashion by moving forward, the ideas that work while discarding the ones that don't. This radically improves your organization's ability to increase the application of ideas that it discovers and, and uh, deploys. So in Agile, right, uh, this, it kind of demands these short cycle uh, uh, iterations. But I think doing these short cycle iterations really demands finding ways to do repetitive things quickly and inexpensively. I think doing things quickly and inexpensively enables teams to respond to changes in ways they, they've never anticipated previously. I think doing things quickly and inexpensively also fosters innovation because it encourages your teams to experiment, make mistakes and failures, but quickly turn around. I think these innovations will ripple out into other parts of your organization by lowering the cost of change, which enables companies to really rethink their business model. I think in the day-to-day -day worker project team, it's, it's hard to remember to innovate outside of your uh, current plan. I think in my experience, allowing your teams to try something different will really energize them and will also bring some surprising and unexpected uh, return on investment to your business. This, this really serves uh, to create the energies of your team. And everything we've discussed so far has really had one central theme. And that theme has been customer feedback, uh, including having them engaged and collaborating throughout your planning. And this is whether in the form of influencing the testing, experimenting, and deliverables at the end of the project. Really, the customer is everything. So all the practices and methods are geared towards collaborating directly with, with the customer and working hand-in-hand -hand through design, prototypes, and, and deployments. Uh, requirements, you know, specifications, and contract negotiations are important and necessary in most situations. But I really think these should only be done in a manner that's conducive to moving your project forward, and most importantly, as a uh, agile servant leader, is really serving the customer. Right? That is really the most important principle out this whole thing. So now let's kind of talk about the core principles of what it means to be a agile servant leader and, and the kind of agenda that, that he or she would need to follow. If there's one central principle of our modern world is that it's that projects, the business climate, and industries are definitely a constant state of flux and change. Things are definitely not as static as they once were, but really highly dynamic, and I would even say go, go so far as to say disruptive. 
the organizations, and this is regardless of, of industry or business sectors, uh, way beyond just software development, uh, will have a higher chance of success in the 21st century uh, being the ones that are able to respond uh, quickly to change and to exploit it. I think the servant mindset that, was, that is expressed in the methods and practices uh, must be driven by this overarching vision and strategy that lies at the principle of how one reacts to change. I think your job as an agile servant leader is to ensure that you have the necessary ingredients in place, such as an environment that's conducive to rapid change, and if it's really not there, then do whatever is necessary to allow your teams and customers to respond to that change. This in turn allows you to, to serve and facilitate that, that incessant change process. And of course, one of the other really important things is obtaining executive support. And it's really critical because you know, I believe it really provides that crucial background support you need to be an effective servant leader. Getting their support and commitment to change requires selling them on the values that would be delivered through your leadership that really resonates with them. I think one of them is having you know, more discipline and consistent delivery. Uh, you may not have all the processes and practices in place, and you may do, do projects with, uh, you know, that differ every time with varying results. But I think having this agile servant you know, leadership mindset will allow you to pursue consistent and deliver, uh, successful delivery of projects uh, when you have teams that can be both directed and guided at the same time. Right? So your current, you know, you may have your current delivery method may be struggling to keep up with the volume and, and volatility of your work, but you'll always be looking for ways to deal with projects that need a quick turnaround and have the minimum requirement uh, uh, definition. Right? And it could be the case that your customers are not happy. Um, your customers could feel disconnected from the process and feel their needs are not being met. Um, so you're always going to look for a way to get the customer more involved in the development process and improve their satisfaction. So as I said, in the end goal, really what it is all about is serving the customer. Right? So if you involve the customer more in the process, their satisfaction rating will definitely improve, even if your deliveries do not. Right? They will always have more empathy for what it takes to create value for them, and in turn, they will have a more positive feel about your company and the development group. In this instance, there really is truth in saying that perception definitely equals reality. And transparency. You know, it's all about the openness and accountability in all areas of business. I think in today's economy, transparency is more important than ever. As companies are forced to strictly manage costs and utilize resources optimally, and for even small to mid-sized companies that have smaller budgets and fewer resources to complete projects, I think using agile practices effectively uh, develop to deliver to develop and deliver uh, products and services can help with that transparency. Uh, tracking, you know, so tracking tools, Kanban boards, incremental unit and acceptance testing, daily stand-up meetings, retrospectives, all this stuff. You know, it's it's really the it's the, the process to help to keep to, to keep the team members from straying off course or going underground. Uh, this transparency can work so well sometimes that it's sometimes misunderstood as a cause of dysfunction. What it's actually uncovering is probably those skeletons in the closet that were hiding all along. So I think project team members must be highly aware of each other's work. They have to be involved in the planning, evaluation of the overall team's progress. And you as a servant leader need to step in when needed um, and to develop and agree on the best practices, uh, as well as helping the team to test and vet one another's contribution. Your role as agile servant leader is to be fully aware of these and the only way is through complete transparency. So Wiz Labs mentioned that they are a Java development provider, and I like this term called manage well, deliver anywhere. Uh, deliver anywhere. This slogan is kind of a play on the Java programming lang language's slogan of run once, uh, or excuse me, run once, run once, run anywhere. You know, it's created by the, the original creators of it, which is some microsystems which was to illustrate the cross-platform benefits of the Java programming language. What I particularly like about this metaphor is that I think it perfectly aligns with 
how one should approach your career as an agile servant leader. If you manage projects well, you should be able to deliver it anywhere and within any industry. I think if you achieve this, you will have a truly portable, cross-industry, and project-based career platform that will never get obsoleted. So the true agile servant leader um, is, is one who really has this ability to transcend um, any industry, any sector, and to lead any project. So I want to dive a little bit more into this idea of customer or servicing the customer. I think as a servant leader, you may need, you may need to even surpass just serve, serving the customer, and it's really more about delighting the customer. So in this one book titled The Leader's Guide to Radical Management, Reinventing the Workplace for the 21st Century, which in my view is practically a manifesto, manifesto on the business adoption of Agile. Uh, this author of management guru named Steve Denning writes about uh, the notion of delighting the customer as really being the central focus uh, for Agile wherever it's applied. I think this melding of technology and business has created a new form um, of project management that will be kind of more strategically focused on delighting the customer. So, this idea of delighting the customer was, uh, was influenced by a report titled, you may as appropriately named, The Age of the Customer, where the, where the focus uh, on manufacturing to distributing information really gives way to this customer-obsessed management. In other words, it's a management paradigm that goes from a focus of, on managing things, which we as traditional project managers are always accustomed to doing for products and services to really managing the customer experience. Therefore, your role as agile servant leader is to do everything possible to delight the customer, the end users and the stakeholders. Because even if agile development and project management came in, you know, into being uh, formally back in around 2001 within the software development community, they were really created to adopt a more efficient and effective method to accommodate the increasingly complex and dynamic business environment. Uh, this is one that was being shaped by the very technologies that those software development projects were creating. So it really makes sense then that uh, other industries from uh, manufacturing, marketing, finance, and even the government, uh, if you've noticed some of the, uh, if you keep up with some of the news going on out there, even, even the government of all, uh, the U.S. government of all institutions have started adopting a more agile outlook. So they're even starting to adopt more agile methods, practices, and principles, right, from the original software development uh, route. Now, I, I don't think this kind of synergy uh, should be surprising, uh, in a sense it really lies at the heart of what it means to be a, a agile servant leader, which is this really obsessive focus on the customer. And I really think any business these days worth anything has as their meat and potatoes this core strategy of delighting the customer. Okay, so finally, what is it that really motivates uh, us? What is that really motivates us to to want to do better? I mean, some of you here are listening to this webinar, and my my assumption, I think, is the correct one, is because all of you are you know, top notch in your field and, and you want to uh, improve yourself. There's a, there's, a, there's, there's a drive that you have that makes you do that. And in this particular case, this book written by Daniel Pink called Drive uh, outlines this interesting idea that, you know, that when it comes to motivation, uh, there's sometimes a gap between what science knows and what business does. Okay? So our current business operating system, uh, to use a metaphor, uh, is built around this kind of external uh, carrot and stick motivator. And what we're finding is that, or at least the science seems to, seems to indicate, that this does, actually doesn't work. And sometimes it actually can be quite harmful. So in a sense, we need to upgrade this business operating system. And the science out there that, according to this book, seems to show the way. Uh, this new approach has uh, three essential elements. One is autonomy, which is the desire to direct our own lives 
Um, and I think it's, it's very much in line with, you know, the general agile principle of, you know, the teams that, uh, the most effective teams are the ones that self-direct themselves. But also keep in mind what we discussed is that it may be the case that you have highly intelligent team members who want to direct themselves, but you as a servant leader need to know when to direct as well as when to guide. And sometimes, you know, you do need to command, right? It's, it's a fine balance uh, to incorporate all of those uh, three elements. But at the core is, you know, you're, you're serving your team is really what you are doing as well as leading. And the second one is mastery, right? Uh, it's this kind of urge to get better and better at something uh, that really matters to us. And then I think that leads into the idea of self-organization, right? If, that's the, if it's the case that you know most of us have this urge to acquire mastery, then we're going to be naturally more inclined to be self-directed. Okay? And then the third one is purpose. And Pink described this as this, this kind of yearning to do what we want to do in service of something larger than ourselves. And if you recall the illustrations of the uh, servant leaders or that, that I outlined in, in my earlier slides with, with you know, the great leaders of, of, of all time, such as Gandhi and Martin Luther King and uh, uh, gentlemen of, uh, uh, like those, um, they had that ability, right? They had that ability to make people uh, want to follow a cause, you know, that was much higher than or much bigger than, than themselves. And to me, that, that's truly what leadership is about. It's, it's not so much just pushing people to do something, but having them want, want to uh, do something and feel like there's a real deep cause for that. Okay? So Pink's book uh, really gives the, the theoretical underpinning to me as to why, ad, why, why agile servant leadership, if it's done properly, is also very powerful. You know? It's up to the agile servant leader to balance that paradox of avoiding too much control or, you know, having too little autonomy, right? It's also not surprising uh, that, what course, that it corresponds to what we've been talking about with respect to the agile servant leader and that you need to better consider how teams, companies, and even organizations uh, and, and, and all those systems work together. Because in the end, it is, after all, people that build software, technology, products, you know, all these, these things out there. Um, and, and I think the better we understand, uh, empathize, and, and motivate people correctly, definitely the better our products and services will be. Okay, so let me conclude by saying, I think developing great products uh, definitely requires things like exploration, experimentation, uh, and, and adaptive flexibility, um, not just simply, you know, tracking against the plan. You know, that, that's, that's what the majority of project managers do out there. I, I think there are these behavior traits that are required uh, to innovate, um, you know, having the courage to explore the unknown, um, and having the humility, which is very important, uh, to recognize mistakes and then to adapt to the situation. So my view, you need to fail to succeed and with greater success, not risk the risk of not allowing failure, right? Um, and as an agile servant leader, failure and success are, are really one and the same. It's the yin and yang. Um, and that, that yin and yang of agile servant leadership is the intersection to which I believe great opportunities uh, present themselves. Okay, so thank you, and that concludes my presentation, and I welcome any questions that you may have. Perfect. That was that was really uh, very informative, uh, Don. Thank you very much. Thank okay, you. So uh, Don is yeah. Well, so Don is here. You know, if there are any questions uh, that you may have for him related to the topic or uh, uh, you know in general, please uh, feel free to uh, you know utilize this uh, forum, this podium to actually ask those questions uh, uh, from Don. 
what I'm going to do is, uh, you know, if you have a question, I can unmute you so that you can directly uh, talk to Dawn and get your query answer or can discuss any specific uh, qu uh, question that you may have. Is any question for Dawn or any question for uh, me or Vislabs? Okay. Yeah, I, I may have uh, talked about topics that were too broad, I don't know, but uh, uh, I welcome any okay. questions or comments. Or, yeah. So that Tom says, Don, excellent presentation. Can you speak to the idea of positional leadership or actually the idea that leading can happen within the organization? So why don't I do this? Why don't I unmute uh, Tom so that, you know, uh, Don, you can directly, uh, uh, you know, have a discussion with Tom. Okay? Sure. Here you go. So, Tom, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Can you hear me? All right, perfect. So, the forum is open. Ask the question from uh, John. He, he'd be more than happy to answer it for you. Don, like I said in my question, um, excellent presentation. I, I'm curious about the idea of, of your thoughts on positional leadership um, and actually that that leaders don't necessarily have positions at the higher echelons of the organization. Oh, that's interesting. Um, so what, what, what you're saying then is that uh, most people that are leaders typically do not have a position higher up in an organization. That's correct. Hmm, interesting. Yeah. You know, I, I, I would say uh, it was back in my the earlier portion of my uh, presentation, which was that oftentimes someone who is considered to call a leader, I mean, it's really there because of uh, because of their position that tells them that they are there, right? Uh, but when you think about people that truly lead any organization, uh, I mean, when you think about like a startup company and how they how they lead a small team and they're not giving a big payoff, if they lead them into into becoming a, a you know a multi billion dollar uh, company, um, I, I think there's some truth in that. And I also think as a uh, when you have a role of a project manager, uh, the people on your team. Uh, don't report to you. So, in a sense, uh, oftentimes you have no uh, recourse to any kind of, you know, disciplinary action or what have you. People don't, uh, you know, comply with whatever they have to do on their project plan. So, oftentimes, to be really effective in that type of a role, uh, you're going to have to take on a more leadership uh, approach and. I think we have the idea that leadership in that regard is one who simply dictates or directs things and people just follow. You know, it's really not the case. It's just the case that you have to both motivate them to do things and also know when to step back um, and, and listen as well. You know, that that's the way you get people on your team to to to, to do things without ha without having them report directly. So that really lies at the heart of it, servant-based leadership. So I would to answer your question, I would say project managers are definitely fit within that mold of positional leadership in that they have to lead teams, sometimes very complex uh, projects and teams, and do so without having without having any formal authority or being in a 
upper position within the company. Excellent. Thank you. Sure. All right. Thanks, Tom. Thanks for uh, answering. Thanks, Tom. Uh, so, uh, what I'm going to do quickly is now, uh, you know, uh, take this session forward and uh, help you, uh, you know, with the slide uh, saying why WIS Labs. So, as I mentioned, that you know, WIS Labs have been into this industry for the last uh, 14 years now. We have been continuously uh, delivering high quality uh, trainings. And, uh, you know, the, the USPs uh, are in front of you. Uh, you know, we, we provide 100% uh, PMP exam pass guarantee, and so does 100% guarantee for all the other uh, trainings that we do, you know, in the field of Java and uh, Agile certifications and so on and so forth. Uh, we do it online the same way that you have been hearing uh, Don. So it's the same way that we do our trainings as well. Uh, the, the, the point is that, you know, the training becomes uh, quite e economical in comparison to the classroom training where you spend a lot of time uh, you know, doing the weekend class, uh, doing the classes, you know, traveling to a certain place and then uh, spending a lot of time. So, you know, this is quite economical. At the same time, uh, a lot of time is also saved. Uh, you get uh, an exam simulator, you know, those practice tests, uh, which is worth $125 for free along with this uh, virtual uh, classroom training. As is this session recorded, so does all the uh, sessions of the training also gets recorded and they are shared with you so that they become your intellectual property. You can uh, use them anytime, you can play them any number of times and uh, you know, uh, can refer back anytime that you want. Also, the, since the class size is very small, so there's a lot of personal uh, attention which has been given to the students that jo uh, join this training uh, in comparison to the classroom training where there are like you know, 25, 30 people joining uh, one batch and uh, the trainer uh, you know is also there to help you to support you even after the uh, uh, the training is over and uh, you know on top of all of this we are not overconfident but we are quite confident that you know if you do not like the training on the very first day you take your 100% refund back you know there's a 100% refund guarantee uh, that we provide so if you do not like the training on the very first thing, you can ask your, uh, you know, claim to be refunded. The, uh, the upcoming training classes, you can see on your screen, the upcoming training classes are uh, starting on April 19th. So April 19th, 20th, 26th, and 27th is when we are going to do these, uh, you know, these classes. And uh, what I'm also quickly going to do is launch a poll in front of you. So uh, by now you might be seeing a poll in front of your screen which you can actually select one of the option which says that uh, you know uh, you may want to attend the upcoming training class or maybe any other option that uh, you know that suits uh, you So guys, I would really appreciate if, uh, you know, all of you could vote uh, as per your, uh, you know, whatever suits, uh, whatever option suits you. It may be a yes, maybe not interested, whatever. You know, I would really, really appreciate if the, you know, every one of you could vote. Perfect. Until that time, anyone has any other questions for Dawn or myself, please let me know uh, so that, you know, we can unmute you. Or, uh, you know, uh, we could uh, type back and answer your query. There's, there, there are a couple of more people who are left. I see there's, you know, 76% people have voted. If the 24% remaining could also vote, I would really appreciate that. Till then, anyone has any questions for Dawn or Wislabs, please feel free to ask those questions. This uh, session is recorded, so the recording would be shared with you by tomorrow. There would be a link which will be shared uh, for this recording.
Okay, Don, any last words that you may want to uh, sort of speak over here, you know, to the to the attendees? Any last uh, advice for the projects? Uh, no, I'm just very honored to have been part of this uh, uh, webinar, and uh, you know, I, I hope you take to heart what was presented and think about, you know, some of the new ways of managing and leading your team. Uh, I think this kind of mindset is pretty important to have going forward. You know, the, the, the times we live in now is it's very rapid and dynamic. Uh, uh, I think having this, that kind of skill set is going to be a very important one going forward. So. Mm -hmm. Right. Honestly saying, I, I really learned a lot from your session, Don. It was really very, very informative. There's a lot that, you know, we can also implement in our day-to-day -day life. Uh, really appreciate, uh, you know, you sharing your thoughts uh, you know, on this. Oh, yeah, sure. uh, thank you. Perfect. So, uh, wait, thank you very much. So, uh, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to close the session. And before I do that, I would quickly inform you that there's going to be an orientation session for uh, the upcoming training, which will happen uh, you know, on one of the Saturdays, uh, for which uh, you, know, you could register on our site. And there will also be an invite, which would be sent to you, so that you can uh, register for the orientation and see how you know, the training actually works. So that is it from my side. I really thank all of you uh, for attending this session and uh, have a nice day ahead. Take care. Bye-bye.